Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host with another marvellous video. The X-Men franchise has had numerous scores of mutants that appeared in several films, starting with the 2000 film X-Men. While some of these, like Professor X and Logan, had the luxury of sharing the constant glare of the spotlight, the others were not lucky enough to find a spot in the crowded movie posters. Every mutant has a set of abilities, and while some may be more powerful than others, it's beyond doubt that all of these people are unique and can do great things. In this video, we'd explore all 64 mutants that ever appeared in the X-Men movie franchise. Without further ado, let's get this show started. Before diving into the content, we'd like to request our viewers to subscribe to Marvelous Videos. Like and comment on our videos and press the bell icon to be notified whenever we upload a video. We would be grateful to you, and we hope to bring you the best nerdy content. And with that, let's get right into this video. Wolverine Wolverine, aka Logan, was born as James Howlett in the early 19th century. His mutant powers came to the fore early in his childhood, but James was yet to learn to control these powers. His bone claws and his exceptional healing ability made him somewhat of a danger to the others, and the worst came to place when James accidentally killed the family estate's groundkeeper, Thomas Logan, who was the birth father of James. After this, James and his half-brother Victor escaped from their house. The two of them would grow up to become Wolverine and Sabretooth. The two brothers participated in several wars, including the American Civil War, the Two World Wars, and the Vietnam War. His superpowers and superhuman resilience earned him the attention and interest of the evil William Stryker, who turned a seasoned warrior into a nefarious killing machine. James now went by the name Logan and had the persona of the Wolverine as intended by Stryker. However, according to the 2013 film The Wolverine, he was captured as a prisoner of war by the Japanese and was kept in a pit in Nagasaki. When a Japanese soldier tried to bring Logan out of the pit, the Americans dropped the atomic bomb. Logan used the pit to save himself and the officer, who we learn is named Ichiro Yoshida. Grateful for this gesture, Yoshida thanks him and Logan departs on his own journey, only to return to Japan years later when Yoshida is about to die. In the X-Men First Class timeline, Logan is approached by Charles and Eric to join the infant X-Men team, but Logan refuses. Later, the X-Men manage to avert the inception of the Third World War, but Professor X becomes paralyzed. However, according to the original timeline, which may be in line with the X-Men First Class timeline, Logan and Victor find themselves fighting for the Americans in the Vietnam War. The two mutant half-brothers join a strike force called Team X. As it turns out, even Deadpool was a part of the team, but the team's overtly violent ways and complete alienation from humanity are a bit too much for Logan, and he walks away. Meanwhile, in the Days of Future Past timeline, reputed industrialist and scientist Bolivar Trask in the year 1973 begins working on his Sentinel program to completely eradicate mutants. In the X-Men Origins timeline, it's been around six years since Logan left Team X and fell in love with a woman, but she was merely a pawn used by Stryker. She fakes her death and frames Sabretooth for it. Logan seeks Stryker's help, which offers Logan adamantium so that he can beat his half-brother. That's how Logan got his iconic metal claws. Later, Stryker shoots a couple of adamantium bullets in his head. Although the shots don't kill Logan, he does end up losing his memory. Logan is then found by Professor X, who recruits Logan as a part of the X-Men. I could go on and on about the extensive role that Wolverine's played in several X-Men movies, but, but maybe I should do that in another video. For now, let's move to our next big entry. Magneto Magneto is easily one of the most charming villains in the Marvel Universe. Yes, he's evil and all that, but he does what he does because he'd been subjected to mental torture and physical pain throughout his early life. Born to a Jewish family in Germany, Eric Lenscher's parents were from Dusseldorf. In 1944, when the Second World War raged in Europe, Nazi SS troops forced Eric away from his parents at the Auschwitz concentration camp. Eric's emotional state became severely unstable, and his mutant powers started to manifest. Despite four guards pulling him away from a metal gate that separated him and his parents, Eric managed to bend the heavy gate. He could have led to immense destruction had he not been knocked unconscious by a fifth guard. It seems that peace was never an option for Eric, a sorry victim of the horrors of war. At Auschwitz itself, he meets Sebastian Shaw, a man worse than Stryker. Shaw was working for the Germans under the guise of Dr. Klaus Schmidt, 
Essentially a mutant collaborator, Wenshaw learned of the abilities that Eric possessed. He tried to befriend the kid and asked him to perform simple tasks like moving a Reichmark coin. However, Eric failed to do his bidding and Shaw shot Eric's mother right in front of him because the trauma and shock would unlock Eric's powers. In his fit of rage and grief, Eric killed two of the Nazi soldiers and destroyed the facility. Unsurprisingly, Shaw was happy with Eric's recent outburst and display of powers. In the next phase of his plan, he began experimenting on and torturing Eric to learn more about his abilities while trying to expand and enhance them. Once he was released from the Auschwitz concentration camp in 1945 following the end of the Second World War, Eric began his search for Sebastian Shaw in a bid to exact revenge. Eric's search for Shaw continued for almost two decades before he finally traced the evil man on a yacht off the American coast. However, Eric fails to kill Shaw and loses to the Hellfire Club. It was now that he would meet Professor Charles Xavier and Raven, an event that would prove to be a major turning point in Eric's life. Eric and Charles joined hands to stop Shaw and the Hellfire Club, who wanted to start the Third World War by pitting the US against the Soviet Union by making use of the Cuban Missile Crisis. However, Eric's mind had been ravaged by grief and a sense of revenge, so much so that he started believing in Shaw's goals of a society where mutants ruled. He also took Shaw's helmet, which protected him against Professor X's powers. From this point, the troubled and tortured kid transformed into the infamous villain Magneto. He's one of the most powerful villains on Earth and owes this stature to his immensely strong magnetokinesis abilities. Capable of manipulating and even generating magnetic energy, he can perform grand and humanly impossible tasks. Up until now, only Apocalypse and Phoenix are the two known mutants who can stand their ground against Magneto. However, Professor X can also manipulate Magneto as long as the latter doesn't wear his helmet. You want what I have? You want to feel what I feel? <laughs> Professor X, Charles Xavier. Clearly one of the most powerful superheroes on Earth, Charles Xavier was born with his mutant abilities. The movies don't throw light on how or when Charles' powers began manifesting, but the comics tell us that he had his mutant powers even before his birth. He shared his mother's womb with a twin, but Charles sensed that the other fetus was malignant and evil, so Charles tried to kill his twin fetus in the womb, which ultimately caused a miscarriage of the malignant twin. Born to Dr. Brian and Sharon Xavier, Charles came to Earth with a silver spoon, but lost his father early to an accident, and his mother passed away a few years later due to alcoholism and grief. By the time he turned nine, his powers had started to manifest for him to understand, which forced Charles to believe that he may be going crazy. However, it became clear to him by the age of 12 that he, in fact, had the ability to read people's minds. Around the same time, Charles met Raven, a shape-shifting mutant who had broken into Charles's house while posing as his mother, Sharon. Charles immediately called the bluff, but he understood that all Raven needed was food and shelter, which he provided her. He was delighted to meet someone who shared similar gifts like him, and Raven lived in his house as his adopted sister. Charles was a prodigy, a natural genius, and it was not before long that he found himself at the Oxford University getting various PhDs in subjects like genetics, biophysics, and psychology. Soon after, CIA agent Moira McTaggart contacted Charles and asked him to help her stop Sebastian Shaw. Professor X's name is rather synonymous with X-Men. Not only has he led various mutant teams in their missions, but he also started a school for the so-called gifted children like himself. Professor Xavier died in the final Logan movie, but he continues to be a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe with his latest role as the leader of the Illuminati in another version of Earth. As far as Professor X's powers are concerned, he's a man with all the brains and little to no brawn, but trust me, he doesn't let that stand in his way. Despite being semi-paralyzed, the mutant professor's brain can achieve grandiose feats. Through telepathy, he can read the minds of and communicate with other mutants, and his powers enhance to unimaginable levels when he uses Cerebro, but it can have adverse effects as well. For instance, once he unintentionally caused excruciating pain to all mutants while wearing Cerebro. Furthermore, he can create illusions and hallucinations in both mutants and humans. This often allows him to shield himself and others from enemies. But that's not all, as he can even transfer his consciousness into other bodies. And of course, he can mind control others, a power that Magneto definitely dreads. Apocalypse Born around 10,000 years ago, Ensabar Nur is possibly the first ever mutant, or so he claims. He claims to have been worshipped by numerous ancient civilizations who called him by various names such as Ra, Shen, and Elohim. 
Later known as Apocalypse, the ancient mutant always had four followers or horsemen whom he bestowed with superpowers. But why the name Apocalypse? Well, as the bearer of immense powers, he easily dethroned a particular place's current rulers and started ruling himself. But that would almost always end in an apocalypse or a cataclysm. It turned out that he would help his civilizations to grow and prosper, but when the place got too populated, he would annihilate the residents, which would pave the way for newer civilizations. A major turning point came to Apocalypse's life when his followers in prehistoric Egypt betrayed him while he was transferring his consciousness and powers into another mutant with an accelerated healing factor. The worshippers collapsed the pyramid, entombing En Sabaneur for several thousand years. However, when the existence of mutants became public knowledge, many in Egypt activated the cult of En Sabaneur. Not only did these fools discover his tomb in Cairo, but also led to his awakening. He wreaked havoc and planned to set a new order on Earth, but was ultimately stopped by the combined force of the X-Men, including the likes of Magneto. Having said that, he was uber-powerful and held a godly status in some circles. In fact, he actually developed a god complex in his later life and made people worship him like a god. His several abilities led him to believe that not only was he a god destined to control every aspect of reality, but he also felt that he was humanity's savior. He has no qualms about killing others, irrespective of them being mutants or humans. In fact, he's actually a god-level sociopath. But this megalomaniac found himself in a bit of a shock when Jean Grey revealed the truly limitless scope of her powers. His powers include, but are not limited to, force field generation, which he uses to shield himself from almost all projectiles and blasts. Portal generation to facilitate traveling huge distances in no time. He can also absorb the knowledge of his victims and otherwise. For instance, he can learn to speak a language within seconds. He can also manipulate matter and change its atomic structure, let alone its physical form. He can even bestow several superpowers to anyone he wants, and of course, this guy can absorb the powers of other mutants. But the most interesting aspect about En Sabanar is that he can transfer his essence into another being, and this ability makes him practically immortal. Sabretooth. I already mentioned earlier that Victor Creed Sabretooth was Wolverine's half-brother, but how strong or weak was their bond? So, in the early 19th century in the Northwest Territories of Canada, Victor was born to Thomas Logan. However, Thomas had another son with a woman named Elizabeth Howlett. The child was named James Howlett. A few years later, Victor visited James and realized that the boy was always sick. Elizabeth's husband, John Howlett, came to check on James and found Victor there. It wasn't before long that a drunk Thomas Logan also came to the spot while looking for Elizabeth. One thing led to another, and Thomas shot John. Stricken with shock and horror, James's mutant powers manifested, and he killed Thomas, his father. Victor understood what it meant. They were monsters and outcasts, and had to flee. Despite being half-brothers, Victor loved James more than a sibling, well, at least for the initial few years. The brothers became strong and resilient, and looked after each other. Eventually, the brothers fought in various wars for the Americans. However, as time passed, Victor became increasingly beastly and violent than James or Wolverine. It turns out that Victor was willing to embrace his animalistic tendencies, which were courtesy of his mutation, as opposed to Wolverine, who was all for hiding his powers. In the later years, Victor took the codename Sabretooth, owing to his protruded set of sharp fangs. Unlike Wolverine, Sabretooth joined the bad guys and often served as the right-hand man of people like Magneto and Stryker. However, Wolverine and Sabretooth did join hands once again to defeat Deadpool. Because of his feral mutation, Sabretooth not only had claws for nails, but he had exceptionally accurate senses. He could sense danger in addition to possessing remarkable olfactory, visual, and auditory senses. And of course, he also had accelerated healing abilities apart from possessing superhuman strength and stamina. <laughs> Cyclops. Born as Scott Summers, in the comics, Cyclops lost his parents when he was a young boy. The traumatic event left its mark on the young boy, and Cyclops became rebellious, angry, and rather troubled. He often found himself in trouble at school, including Professor Xavier's school for the gifted. However, he was quick to befriend Jean Grey and the Nightcrawler. But Cyclops' rebellious nature subdued, and he became more serious when Apocalypse killed his older brother in the new timeline. Scott wanted to follow his brother, whom he considered a role model and a personal hero. In the original timeline, however, he was one of the original members of the X-Men, and because of his experience, experience, he often led the field missions. He was definitely a good leader when it came to field missions, but the same cannot be said when it came to other aspects. Of course, his love for Jean Grey is something of a constant in both timelines, and Cyclops is anything but a boring guy. Cyclops' major power is the optic energy blast that can tear through anything from wood to concrete and steel. 
Because these blasts are uncontrollable and continuous, he wears a visor made of ruby quartz to control the blast intensity. This also protects his environment from any unintentional destruction. Jeez. Grey. The story of Jean Grey was quite different in the original and revised timelines. While in the original timeline her parents invited Charles and Eric to speak to Jean, the revised timeline is much darker and shows that Jean's mother died because of an accident that was Jean's doing. Nevertheless, Jean Grey became one of the most important mutants ever and probably the strongest of them all. She can literally possess god-level powers if she can control the Phoenix Force. More on that in a bit. Although she grew up as much of a loner at Professor Xavier's school, she befriended Cyclops and Nightcrawler quite quickly. This was because both Jean and Cyclops had the common ground of uncontrolled power, and Nightcrawler was dejected by many because of how he looked. But Jean Grey is one of the most complex mutants ever. She has an alter ego who likes to be called Phoenix. In the new timeline, she's allowed by Professor X to embrace her Phoenix personality, and it was so potent that it destroyed Apocalypse. When she merges with the Phoenix, she can control the Phoenix Force, which is a sentient and ancient force that can transform matter into life, and is the very spark that created the first life in the universe. However, since the Force is sentient, it often possesses the being it resides within. As it happens, the Force that gives life is also the one that causes destruction, so Phoenix Force can be both a bane and a boon. So if Jean Grey manages to completely control the Phoenix, she can possess godlike powers of life creation as well as planetary destruction. Storm Born Aurora Monroe, Storm's backstory was largely a mystery in both the timelines. However, the revised timeline suggests that she was a pretty thief in Cairo before Apocalypse found and recruited her. As a child, she idealized Mystique, but in the original timeline, the two of them were colleagues who went on several missions together before the eventual fallout. Storm is an indispensable member of the X-Men and has proven time and again that she's dependable. However, she was definitely scared and angry toward humans, a trait that is more pronounced in her younger self. Storm served as a mother figure to the students at Xavier's school. Storm's powers are the manipulation of weather, which she uses in numerous ways to get additional abilities. For instance, she used wind and lightning to travel at high speeds. She also uses lightning as a weapon and can summon tornadoes to keep enemy airplanes at bay. She has some form of connection with her environment and gets things in the form of pure energy. This allows her to see even in opaque and conditions such as fog and clouds. A version of this enhanced visual sense comes into action when Storm has to anticipate and counter impending attacks from opponents. She does this by clearly seeing the neuroelectric network in her opponent's body. Beast Beast also went by the name Hank, but he was born as Henry Philip McCoy. Hank was always good as a person, but his mutation turned him into a literal beast, and he was rather ashamed of it while growing up. But on the other hand, he was a genius who received a PhD at the age of 15. He used his knowledge to create a serum that hid his mutant form, but eventually, Professor X helped him accept and embrace his mutant form. And from a shy and troubled kid, he changed into a confident and brave superhero. A man of science and engineering, Hank, Hank became an integral and important part of X-Men, and he created several pieces of technology, including aircrafts and the first Cerebro prototype. Kind of like She-Hulk, Hank also represented mutants in courtrooms and helped Professor X build the school while he served as a teacher. Beast gets his power from his mutation, which changes him into something like a giant blue gorilla with multiple times the strength. However, Hank retains his essence and consciousness when in this form but Hank's powers are proportional to his level of mutation. For instance, after his initial transformation, he can press at least one ton, but after the secondary mutation, he can easily press up to 10 tons. Mystique Gifted with the power of shape-shifting, Raven Darkholm had a grievously troubled childhood because of her realm form. At some point, she became afraid of attending school, but the worst came to place when her own parents tried to kill her. She eventually ran away from home and crashed into Xavier's mansion, who adopted her as a sister. According to the original timeline, Mystique turned out to be a beautiful seductress who didn't shy away from killing people in cold blood. Part of the reason lies in the years of cruel experiments that were performed on her, and part of it was the result of the inhuman treatment that she received from humans. 
humans. Naturally, she formed a lowly opinion of humans. But despite all of this, she did have a humorous side, which was not as dark as her own life. After finding Charles, she found a family that understood and appreciated her for who she was, but years of trauma had conditioned her to be ashamed of her true form. You want society to accept you, but you can't even accept yourself. But this changed after she met Magneto, who convinced and encouraged her to embrace her true form and be proud of her abilities instead of looking for acceptance. According to the revised timeline, Mystique is spending her days as a lone wolf, but it seems that she doesn't have any malevolent and evil thoughts in her heart. Mystique's primary superpower is shape-shifting, which enables her to transform into just about anyone, no matter their gender, build or voice. She can control her cell structure, and sometimes she can even replicate non-living objects such as the Statue of Liberty. Furthermore, a low-level yet superhuman healing ability allows Mystique to stay younger than her biological age. When people touch my skin, something happens. What? I don't know. Rogue. Did you know that Anna Paquin, who played Rogue in the X-Men movies, is the second youngest Oscar winner? Yep, when she was just 11, she won the Oscar for the Best Supporting Actress for the film The Piano. So, Rogue had the power of absorbing the life force of other mutants as well as humans. In fact, she could also absorb their memories and personality of anyone she touched. And these poor souls end up losing their consciousness, go into a coma, and in worst cases, they could even die. Although it might seem like a great power, Rogue also suffers a mental imprint of the trauma that her victims have suffered in their past life, and it's almost never a pretty picture. For the more, apart from the life force, Rogue also absorbs the powers of the people she touches, but she cannot really retain these powers for long, and sometimes she may even struggle with controlling these powers. She used to be a shy girl, hiding from humans and living her life alone, as she had no control over her powers. In fact, her powers manifested during her first kiss, and it sent the boy into a coma. That's much along the lines of Wednesday Adams from the new Netflix show. The first guy she kisses turns out to be a monstrous serial killer. Nevertheless, Wolverine tends to serve as a surrogate father to Rogue, so much so that he's given his ability to rapidly regenerate to her. It's worth a shot. Kurt. <laughs> Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler's early life was a book of woes, written in the ink of pain, suffering, and abuse. Soon after his birth, he was taken in by a circus, and he grew up there. He mastered his acrobatic and gymnastic skills as a circus performer before being forced to fight in a deadly cage fight and being rescued by Mystique. Much like other mutants, Nightcrawler has exceptional strength and stamina, but his primary superpower is teleportation. He can teleport to literally any place, given he knows where that place is. When he does that, it seems that he's evaporated and left a dark blue cloud behind. In his youth, he could teleport himself, but teleporting others caused him extreme exhaustion. However, his kind of teleportation weakens the travelers, especially if they can't teleport on their own. But Nightcrawler uses this to his advantage and constantly teleports his opponents to weaken them. For instance, that's what he did with Archangel. Additionally, Nightcrawler had enhanced spatial awareness of the places he's teleporting to, which helps him evade ending up inside big objects or crashing into humans or animals. Among his more animalistic abilities is the prehensile tail that allows him to grab onto them and hang with ease. But when all else fails, Nightcrawler can always use his ability to make himself invisible. Sebastian Shaw Once Sebastian Shaw learned about his energy absorption powers, he started to believe that mutants were a superior race and were destined to rule the humans. He later joined the Nazi forces and was present at the Auschwitz concentration camp when Eric, aka Magneto, ended up there. As a person, Shaw was persuasive and charismatic, but he could go to any length to get what he wanted. One could say he was a charming villain who preferred using his words than his muscles, but he would resort to violence whenever necessary. To achieve his goal of world domination, Shaw assembled a group of mutants to form the Hellfire Club. He planned to start a war between the Soviet Union and Russia to achieve his objective and and would have succeeded if not for Professor X, Magneto, and their fellow mutants. However, in the end, Sebastian's legacy lived on with Magneto, who started believing in Sebastian's cause. Sebastian could absorb all the earthly forms of energy in any amount, but it's unknown if he could absorb the resultant energy from a force of cosmic nature, such as the Phoenix Force. The absorptions gave him youth, but 
that's the boring part. What he could do with this energy was unimaginably terrifying. He could metabolize energy and throw it back at the opponent. Since almost all the attacks and strikes have some form of energy, he was exceptionally difficult to defeat, although Magneto killed him by moving a coin extremely slowly through his head. The slow movement reduced the momentum to a negligible level and by extension, the coin had almost zero kinetic energy. Don't you know who I am? Shadow Cat Born Catherine Pride, she took the name Shadow Cat after her abilities of phasing through matter. However, her role in the original timeline was not quite important other than serving as an enemy to Rogue because of a shared romantic interest in Rogue. However, in days of future past, Shadowcat played a crucial role in saving the mutant race. In the film, the world was ravaged by huge robots called the Sentinels, who were designed for hunting down mutants. Amidst these troubled times, the remaining mutants were being led by Professor X and Magneto, but defeating the Sentinels was not their cup of tea, and the only way to do so was to go back in time and stop the Sentinel program from taking off in the first place. It was now that Shadowcat came into the picture. Apart from phasing out through matter, another superpower that she possessed was phasing the consciousness of people into their former selves. She does this to Wolverine under the guidance of Professor X. However, Wolverine met Stryker in the past and he was overwhelmed with rage. He drew his claws in the past, but his present self also did the same and injured Shadowcat, which broke the connection between herself and Wolverine. However, Rogue took over from her. Colossus. Although Colossus was there in the X-Men movies, I think it's more prudent to discuss his role in the Deadpool movies, because that's perhaps the most permanent continuity. After learning about Deadpool, a new mutant, Colossus, tried his best to bring Deadpool into the realm of the good mutants. In fact, Colossus even subdued and handcuffed Deadpool, intending to bring him to X-Mansion and have a word with the Professor. But that didn't happen because Deadpool severed his wrist to escape. Throughout the remainder of the movie, Colossus agreed to help Deadpool in rescuing Vanessa, Deadpool's love interest. In Deadpool 2, the love-hate relationship between Colossus and Deadpool took many hilarious turns, with Deadpool often trying to apologize to the Man of Steel for creating a ruckus on live television, an event that tarnished the reputation of the X-Men. In the end, Colossus fought the mighty Juggernaut and was forced to fight Dirty. Despite his intimidating appearance and build, Colossus is soft on the inside, always devoted to helping others and always trying to be a good man. Always a man of honor, he was someone who would close his eyes when his enemy's breasts popped out. Born as Piotr Nikolaevich Rasputin, Colossus had the ability to convert his entire body into a steel-like metal. The transformation is virtually instantaneous and under the Colossus's control. And quite obviously, this state gives Colossus immense strength and power. Juggernaut Did you see that big bulky fighter in the X-Men movies? No, not Colossus. I'm talking about Juggernaut. You'll be surprised to know that Juggernaut's origin was quite tragic. He was born as Kane Marco, a young boy who had just moved into his stepmother Sharon Xavier's house where he met his stepbrother Charles Xavier, a mutant with the powers to read thoughts and emotions. Cain bullied his stepbrother into hiding his anguish of being secretly abused by his father, and he soon figured out that Charles could read his thoughts and found his secret, which he thought was a gross invasion of privacy, and he continued to hate Charles. For years, the duo lived in the Xavier Mansion where Cain grew jealous and bitter about Charles's powers and academic achievements. They also served in the army together. Once on a mission in the lost secret temple of Sithrak, Cain grabbed a ruby from an idol's head and gained juggernaut superhuman abilities in front of Charles. But he was buried under thousands of rocks by enemy bombs while Xavier survived and joined his unit. Using his powers, Juggernaut dug himself out and made his way to America to kill Xavier, but was defeated by the original X-Men team. Throughout his lifetime, Juggernaut has smashed bones with X-Men, Spider-Man, Hulk, and the Avengers. So, it was only natural for X-Men to use their powerful villain in X-Men The Last Stand, and the character was revived in Deadpool 2, voiced by Deadpool actor Ryan Reynolds. Juggernaut is so strong that it's difficult to imagine an X-Men team could defeat him on their own. His power and endurance appear to be infinite and unsurpassed. He has the ability to generate an infinite volume of kinetic energy, and once in sequence, he's unstoppable. We hope the movies learn how to use this character well in future projects with all its superhuman glory as projected in X-Men, The Last Stand, in a fight with Kitty Pride. Ah!
Gambit. The film X-Men Origins, the Wolverine introduced the magical thief Gambit. We first see him playing poker in New Orleans, living under an assumed name, and is shocked when Logan calls him Gambit and attacks him with his playing cards, assuming he's there to take him back as a prisoner. Well, he was taking him back there, but only to drop Logan off, considering he was the only one who knew the location. Earlier, it was revealed that he was also a prisoner of William Stryker at Three Mile Island and was the only one who escaped. Remy Lebeau, also known as Gambit, is a delightful thief with the genetically mutated power to charge objects and induce them to blow up. Gambit's dark path prompted him to work as a covert agent for the heinous Mr. Sinister after he was born into the Thieves' Guild. He was welcomed to the X-Men after joining fellow mutant thief Storm and had the chance to reclaim himself. Remy immediately fell in love with Rogue, who was born with the power to absorb the thoughts and abilities of other mutants through touch. The attraction was mutual, but the two were forbidden from ever touching. Gambit can cognitively create, control, and manipulate pure kinetic energy to his liking. He can make a deck of cards explode. He also has extensive skills and knowledge in card throwing, arm combat, and the usage of a bow staff. Although the extent of his abilities is unknown, he's been seen lifting and carrying four heavy steel beams while flying without strain. His abnormally hypnotic charm allows him to gain influence over others. Indeed, it's said that his charisma is so strong that he could even enchant the Shadow King. The Gambit is a fascinating character, and the X-Men downplayed this character in the movies. Hope they explore the lesser-known characters in future projects. Piper. DC's Poison Ivy had a competitor in Marvel. She goes by the name of Madame Viper, an antagonistic mutant first seen in the 2013 film The Wolverine, where she was looking after the sick Yashida and later poisons Wolverine with a kiss. Talk about a kiss of death. But did you know Viper used to be Wolverine's wife in the comics? As a child, Ophelia Sarkissian was orphaned in Hungary. Ophelia was one of 12 girls captured in by Hydra and brought up by Kraken. Ophelia thrived for 22 years and was Kraken's smartest kid. She ultimately climbed the ranks of Hydra and clashed with Captain America and the Shield. She first emerged as a Hydra ruler under the pseudonym Madame Hydra, fighting and capturing Captain America. Madame Hydra has also clashed with the X-Men. She first encountered them while attempting to kill Mariko Yashida at the behest of her alliance and supposed lover Silver Samurai and attempted to infect the team while considering sealed as Mariko's incapacitated maid. She nearly destroyed X-Men members Rogue and Storm twice, with Storm being killed by Viper during Khan's invasion. She also encountered the new mutants and was blamed for Karma's presumptive downfall. She later coerced Wolverine into getting married to her in order to safeguard her crime syndicate in Madripoor. Despite the fact that this was a marriage of convenience, she had feelings for Wolverine. Soon, Wolverine demanded a divorce in exchange for saving her life. As a form of restoration, Viper can heal her wounds by shedding her injured skin like a snake. Toxins and contaminants have no effect on her. She possessed snake-like flexibility and reflexes, allowing her to avoid Yukio's blade attack while the sword was only mere inches from striking her. Viper, like a snake, has a long tongue which she needs to generate her lethal toxins. Her name is apt for her actions. Lady Deathstrike Yuriko Oyama, popularly known as Lady Deathstrike, was a mutant with adamantium claws like Wolverine. In the movies, she was William Stryker's bodyguard. Yuriko Oyama, commonly known as the samurai warrior Lady Deathstrike, is a killing machine with a self-repairing body and lethal adamantium claws. She is the daughter of Lord Darkwind, a deranged and violent Japanese tycoon who devised a method of coating bones with adamantium. After killing her father, Oyama became engrossed with Wolverine, who had been unjustly augmented with adamantium and defamed Oyama's honor. In order to be as deadly as Wolverine, Oyama gave up her humanity. Deathstrike's hatred for Wolverine has helped lead her to form alliances with heinous characters, particularly William Stryker, a mutant-hating extremist. Her actions frequently bring her into conflict with the X-Men. Her powers are very similar to Wolverine's. She can elongate her claws up to 12 inches in length, giving her strength to kill targets from a distance. She also has superhuman strength, speed, balance, and reflexes. But the crazy thing about Deathstrike is that she can block psychic attacks and has a high restraint to telepathy. She can also connect her brain with external computer systems, making her one of the most impressive mutants in the X-Men universe. Toad 
Mortimer Toynbee was born in York, England, and was eventually left by his mom and dad. He spent years in a children's home, where he was continually traumatized by other children because of his nastiness and oddly shaped body. During his primary years, he was deemed inferior due to his severe awkwardness and fairly benign developmental disorders, despite being quite intelligent. He left school at a young age and finally agreed to ward for himself. Mortimer suffered from severe feelings of inadequacy as a result of years of neglect and realizing full well that he was a weirdo, becoming obedient to anyone who displayed him even the tiniest trace of admiration. Later, he joined Magneto's original Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Toad thought Magneto appreciated him, but the mutant genius saw him as nothing more than a scapegoat. He was also infatuated and his then teammate, the Scarlet Witch, which resulted in a lifelong feud with her and her brother, Quicksilver. Toad assisted Magneto in numerous conflicts with the X-Men as a participant in the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. The main ability of the Toad is the skill to jump to heights and distances far higher than that of a normal human. He retains some heroic strength, especially in his legs, which allows him to leap higher than most. He's recently proved a better understanding of fight and a sleeker muscularity, taking full advantage of both his jumping ability and his long, opposable tongue. The Toad's muscles work far fewer lethargy toxins than regular humans. He can impose himself at full capacity over several hours until fatigue sets in. Despite his great abilities, the X-Men film released in 2000 showed him in a very small role, which highlighted him catching a bird with his elongated tongue. Quicksilver. Remember when Marvel confused the audience by changing the actors of famous characters as they did with Rhodey, Hulk, and most recently with Wanda's brother Pietro Maximoff? Evan Peters was seen playing the character in X-Men movies who was deemed to be Magneto's son, and later Aaron Taylor Johnson played the character in Avengers Age of Ultron. But they brought back Evan Peters in WandaVision to play a knockoff version of Wanda's dead twin brother, sent by Monica Rambo. The entire ordeal was very confusing for the fans. Pietro Maximoff was a mutant who became famous as Quicksilver, a mutant who ran with superhuman speed and had some very witty one-liners in the movie. He was mostly sparring with Hawkeye. It's not not very often for Marvel to change the entire origin story of a character, but they did so for Quicksilver since the mutants were not part of Marvel movies just yet. In the movies, Pietro was a twin to Wanda and lived in Sokovia. He lost his parents in a bombing drone by the US using Stark weapons, and thus the siblings grew up hating the United States and Tony Stark. Sokovia, engrossed in continuous war and strife, had become the operating base for Baron Strucker's Hydra cell, which hired Pietro and Wanda as participants for Scepter experimental tests. Pietro gained the power to move at superhuman speeds after being subjected to the Mind Stone inside the Scepter and was termed Quicksilver. Just after the Avengers' invasion of the Hydra research facility, the twin decided to join Ultron to proceed with their pursuit of vengeance, but later changed allegiances and aided the Avengers after discovering Ultron's real intent. Pietro then decided to join the Avengers and ended up fighting in the Battle of Sokovia, but he gave his life to safeguard Hawkeye and Costel, much to the chagrin of his sister Wanda, known as the Scarlet Witch. Pietro's sacrifice was not in jest, as the Avengers defeated Ultron and prevented him from carrying out his plan. Bishop. Lucas Bishop is a mutant born in a futuristic world who has journeyed back in time to join the X-Men, the famed mutants he'd only known from storybooks. Bishop was a participant in the XSE mutated police force in his timeline. While on the trail of the convicted felon Fitzroy, Bishop joined a portal and reached decades before his birth. Through the X-Men, he re-evaluated his autocratic family background and found a family on which to rely. Bishop's military training has led him to approach mutant human connection from a law enforcing standpoint, which he's done by connecting the extreme X-Men and acting as a peacemaker in Mutant Town. After the birth of Hope, the mutant messiah who was said to have induced his world to routinely indict mutants, Bishop deceived the X-Men in an unexpected twist of fate. After years of searching for Hope, Bishop has finally found atonement by repenting of his deeds. Bishop can recover at a quicker rate than the average person. Bishop's restorative factor grows correspondingly to the quantity of energy absorbed, ultimately hitting superhuman levels. Its recovery limit is unknown, but the more power it absorbs, the faster it regenerates. Bishop's resilience increases dramatically as he consumes more energy. 
His strength limit is connected to how much power he can comprehend. He's recently shown the ability to accumulate the majority of the power from all intrusions, irrespective of the type, making him nearly impervious to all threats. Bishop is played by Omar Sy in the movie X-Men Days of Future Past. <laughs> X-23. One of my personal favorites, this girl from Logan took everyone by surprise. She had a dark tale, which is darker still in the comics, and she was known by an experimental title, X-23. A top secret program has been tasked with replicating the earliest Weapon X study that resulted in the rabid mutant Wolverine. The venture has taken a new turn. Dr. Martin Sutter hires famed geneticist Dr. Sarah Kinney to create a Wolverine replica. Kinney is not able to recoup the Y chromosome because the only genetic sample from Weapon X is compromised. Kinney suggests creating a female clone, but her proposal is rejected. Rejected. After 22 failed attempts to replicate with a clone X chromosome, the 23rd sample produced a feasible embryo. Even though Kinney is permitted to move forward, Rice takes revenge for her disobedience by pressuring her to behave as the clone's surrogacy arrangement. Kinney's every move is tracked for nine months before she gets pregnant with X-23. Rice subjects X-23 with radioactive poisoning after seven years to stimulate her gene mutation. He retrieves her claws, coats them with adamantium, and attaches them to her feet and hands, all without anesthesia for the child. Rice generates a trigger scent that, when detected, sends X-23 into a homicidal rage. Rice subjected Kinney to the trigger scent prior to his death. X-23 goes on a murdering spree and slays her mother. Kinney tells X-23 that her name is Laura and that she loved the young child as she died. She hands her the letter with pictures of Charles Xavier, Wolverine, and the Xavier Institute. X-23, like Wolverine, has an expedited healing component that allows her to regrow broken or destructed cells at a much faster and more efficient rate than a normal human. She's capable of completely reparative humongous tissue damage and blood loss wounds, such as bullet wounds in a matter of minutes. <laughs> Angel. Angel is a mutant with a supernatural ability to fly. The character was born with a pair of large downy feathers that extended from his back, allowing him to fly. Because he's the eldest son of the wealthy Worthington family, Warren cannot really join the X-Men. A more reflective and gloomy demeanor soon replaced this individual in the late 1980s, and this guy went by the name Arc Angel. Nevertheless, Angel's wings were initially feathered, but his transformation to Archangel resulted in metallic wings and newly acquired abilities. Archangel, as one of the earliest X-Men, has emerged in X-Men comic books over the years, as well as in X-Men animated movies and video games. Ben Foster performed as Angel in X-Men The Last Stand in 2006, and Ben Hardy played a younger version in X-Men Apocalypse in 2016. Warren's principal ability is flight, thanks to his huge wings. His power, speed, flexibility, adaptability, stamina, quick reactions, synchronization, balance, and listening are all at an all-time high. His physiology is similar to that of birds, particularly birds of prey like eagles. His eyes can endure high-speed winds that would harm a normal human eye. Furthermore, he can inhale at high speeds or heights, and he can tolerate cooler pressure at altitudes for lengthy periods of time. His innate wings have enough power to destroy a man's limbs, or even put a person through a wall. While he usually continues to fly underneath the clouds, Angel can easily reach nearly twice that altitude with very little exertion. Angel evolves a healing ability as a consequence of a backup mutation that has been shown infrequently and can cure others by blending his blood with theirs. He's here to kill you. Emma Frost Emma Frost is a strong and influential mutant with telepathic powers, renowned as the White Queen of the Hellfire Club. Born into a wealthy Boston household, she left her family to build a business empire with Frost International, eventually rising to a position of influence in the Hellfire Club's inner circle. Emma Frost has played a greater part in the comics than in the movies. She was seen in X-Men First Class, where she played the antagonist along with Sebastian Shaw. Emma Frost retains telepathic powers comparable to Charles Xavier's and has been described as an Omega-class telepath. Furthermore, she's been regarded as one of the five telepaths in the world skilled in flawlessly and effortlessly altering someone's mind, and has shown the capacity to stand off Exodus and resolve telepaths through more extensive knowledge and abilities. Frost can telepathically conceal her appearance and use her strength from many other mutants and psychics. These defenses can also be stretched to those around them. Emma can make feasible telepathic hallucinations and cause individuals to view events that are far from reality. In the movie, she turned out to be a cold but calculative lady who didn't shy away from switching sides if it suited her personal ambitions. Ice 
Iceman. Born as Robert Louis Drake, Iceman's friends call him Bobby. As a child, when his mutation manifested, he was afraid of telling his parents but managed to make his way to Professor X's school. He became friends with Pyro and a love interest of Rogue. As a person, Iceman was rather an everyman, always willing to help his friends. Although sometimes laid back, he was calm, composed and level-headed. When it came to being a member of the X-Men, Bobby often went out of his way to help. In fact, in X-Men Days of Future Past, Bobby sacrificed his own life so that he could buy more time to his colleagues who were fighting the Sentinels. Bobby's primary power was cryogenesis, or the ability to freeze almost anything. He could generate and manipulate ice with his hands and could transform his entire body into organic ice. Of course, he could also shoot a coolant-like gas that also froze things. Iceman's power relied upon water in liquid as well as gaseous form, and since water vapor is abundant on Earth, his limits originate in his physical and mental capacity. But he was smart enough to often use his power to slide or to build ice walls as barriers. <laughs> Pyro. Born as John Allardyce, Pyro could manipulate fire, but could not create it out of thin air. As a hot-headed man, he was quick to anger and loved to show off his powers, often endangering the lives of mutants and humans near him. Given the personality that he had, he soon became a member of Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants and started to believe that he was a god among insects. Although he came around by the end, Pyro was not really given much importance in the later films or the revised timeline. His powers include fire manipulation, which he uses to the best of his capability. In one of the instances, he could cause a small explosion using nothing but a cigarette flame. His powers also allow him immunity against heat and fire, and one cannot necessarily kill him by burning. Because he can't create fire, he's developed a sixth sense of sort that detects any form of fire in his vicinity, and he doesn't even have to look to increase the intensity of these sources of fire. Quill Maxwell Jordan, or Quill, was one of the less powerful mutants. He used to be a part of the Omegas, a mutant outcast group that fought for global mutant supremacy. Quill's power was sprouting quills the same way a porcupine does. However, these could be expelled at high speed and cause severe damage. Using these quills as ranged weapons, Quill could kill people at both short and long distances. But that's about it. In the comics, his entire body is covered in these porcupine-like quills, but the live-action movies tell a different story. Nonetheless, Quill died while escaping during during the Phoenix event. Sunspot Roberto da Costa was a rich Brazilian boy who accidentally burned his own girlfriend when he failed to control his mutant powers. In the new Mutants movie, he was sent to Milbury Hospital after the incident, but the trauma of hurting others followed Roberto. He mistakenly believed that he and the other new mutants were being trained to become X-Men, and the truth shocked him. By the end of the film, Roberto managed to overcome his trauma and fear. This helped him embrace his solar manipulation powers, and who he really was. Clearly, Roberto could absorb and manipulate solar energy in his cells and could release them whenever he wished to. In fact, he can absorb so much energy that he can literally transform into what can only be described as a humanoid sun. And I don't think I have to tell you how powerful that form of sunspot would be. Much like the sun emits solar flares, Roberto could project intense heat waves. Warpath. So, Warpath appeared in Days of Future Past in which he was among the last remaining free mutants. While the other mutants took up active defense positions in their fight against Sentinels, Warpath served as a scout for the team. It was he who alerted the group about the arrival of a Sentinel army when Logan's consciousness was transferred to his past self. Warpath's visual and auditory senses are far too enhanced and he can see and hear things that are far away with impeccable clarity. Even darkness doesn't obstruct his sight. Much like the other mutants, he had superhuman strength and stamina, but additionally, Warpath was great with combat knives. Deadpool. Ho ho, what do we have here? I'm pretty sure that Deadpool needs no introduction to anyone who's come this far watching the video. Wade Wilson, aka Deadpool, is an extremely sarcastic and humorous individual, and when it comes to fighting, he can be pretty badass. I personally believe that one of his superpowers is the ability to piss off people. Not very many people can really withstand his constant talking, and Deadpool can really anger people to their bones. 
Interestingly enough, he's well aware that he's actually a fictional character in a movie and often breaks the fourth wall. Despite coming off as a mean mercenary, he's actually soft on the inside and can go to any limits to help the people he loves or cares for. Talking about all of this makes me miss Dupinda and Geeta. Deadpool had a horrible start with the X-Men franchise, but the last couple of standalone films have done justice to this iconic character. The Deadpool from the original timeline had several powers like the ability to shoot optic blasts and electricity manipulation. However, the new Deadpool effectively killed the original one. Yet, Deadpool has the same enhanced healing as Wolverine and may even be better at combat than Wolverine. But then again, his rather immature nature would probably even the odds if the two epic mutants were ever to duel each other. John, this is something I always wanted to tell you. John Wraith, also known as Kestrel. John Wraith had the psionic ability to teleport through space without creating any extra light or sound. He had complete control over his powers and used it to initially surf Stryker as a part of Team X. However, several years later, when the original Team X got disbanded, Wraith opened a gym in Las Vegas. When Wolverine came to John asking for help and information about Adamantium and Sabretooth, John did all he could to help him, but got mortally wounded by Sabretooth, who predicted John's moves. Interestingly, John Wraith had dubious morality. On the other hand, he willfully and consciously committed genocides on the orders of Stryker, but on the other hand, he felt rem remorse for his actions. Wraith's character could have been used in better ways for the ambiguity he stored within him, and that's probably all that I can say about him. The Blob Well, anyone accustomed to the X-Men movies should know who The Blob is. Born as Frederick J. Dukes, the man went on to become morbidly obese and huge to the level that he didn't feel any pain. In the movies, most of his role comprised fighting other mutants in the ring. Blob's huge body has immense resistance to almost all incoming physical attacks. He's almost incapable of feeling any pain because his nerve endings on the body don't relay information to the brain about an attack. Since the brain doesn't receive information, his body doesn't feel pain. In one of the scenes, Blob inserted his hand inside a cannon and forced the ball to explode, but the impact was next to nothing for him. Furthermore, due to his immense weight, he's practically immovable, unless he wishes to move. Turn around. Walk into your feet, bleed. Silver Fox After Wolverine left Team X, Kayla Silver Fox was tasked by Stryker to keep an eye on Wolverine. She met him and the two started a relationship that lasted for six long years until she was allegedly killed by Sabretooth. It turns out that she agreed to spy on Wolverine because she wanted to save her sister, Emma, who was one of Stryker's test subjects. Despite her wrongdoings, she was a loving and compassionate woman who wanted to look out for those she loved. When Silver Fox reveals her secret to Wolverine, it leaves him heartbroken, but the two of them ultimately work together to free the mutant test subjects. Unfortunately, Kayla gets severely wounded, but she manages to exact her revenge on Stryker using her tactile mind control on Stryker. So, Kayla's power is basically hypnotizing others by her touch. The hypnosis is immediate and long-lasting, but doesn't quite work on mutants with accelerated healing factors. All other mutants and humans follow her command without question. It seems that Silver Fox was Wolverine's first serious love, and it was her loss that made him choose the new name Wolverine for himself because of a story that she once told Wolverine about the moon and her lover named Kue Kuautsu, which translates into Wolverine. Riptide. In the year 1962, the aerokinetic genius Riptide served as an active member of Sebastian Shaw's Hellfire Club. Along with Shaw and Azel, he attacked Division X and successfully destroyed the satellite that helped Professor X use Cerebro. In the fight against the X-Men, Riptide used his powers to create a tornado, which caused the X-Jet and a submarine to crash land on the beach. However, Magneto manages to knock Riptide out. When the battle was over and Shaw was killed by Magneto, Riptide became a follower of Magneto because his and Shaw's causes were the same. Riptide's primary power was the manipulation and creation of winds of various intensities. Quite obviously, this power also provided him the ability to fly and he could do so efficiently, even inside a tornado. Speaking of tornadoes, this guy could create tornadoes by spinning rapidly. I think he should have been named Human Tornado or something instead of Riptide, because Riptide is essentially an area in the sea where two or more currents collide with each other. Yeah. 
Arclight. Arclight was born as Philippa Sontag to immigrant parents who came to the US shortly before Arclight discovered her powers. Her early life was full of woes because of the constant bullying she faced due to her appearance and dressing sense. She was initially a member of the Omegas but started following Magneto in her later life. During the Phoenix event, she died a sorry death by disintegrating and turning into dust. As a person, she was devilish, with a remorseless, mysterious, and sinister personality. She held no qualms about killing people, and if she was feeling kinder, she would brutally disarm her opponents. Due to her masculine features and modified dress sense, it's possible that she was androgynous, but it was not really elaborated. Arclight's main power was generation of shockwaves. I've already mentioned that she was a bullied child, and the year that she first discovered her powers, the town experienced several fatal attacks, and all of these included electricity. Much like Hulk, she could generate shockwaves by swinging her arms in front of her body and clapping. But the most interesting aspect about these shockwaves was their precision. In one of the scenes, she targeted plastic mutant cure guns, which were very specific objects. Often described as being more sinister than Magneto himself, Arclight could have been a great villain, but the character was killed way too soon. Havoc Alex Summers, or Havoc, was the elder brother of Cyclops. Much like Cyclops, Havoc could shoot blasts of energy, but he'd learned to control it much before Cyclops did. Considered by Cyclops as a hero, Havoc lost his life while defending mutants from Apocalypse. As a person, Havoc was kind, protective, and always supportive of other people. He was immensely powerful because he had the ability to shoot powerful disks of energy from his body. These blasts were powerful enough to burn through almost anything, leaving nothing but ashes. To channel his energy and make the blasts more, precise. Beast built Havoc a suit which allowed him to shoot the beams from his chest. These beams rippled somewhat like sonic blasts. However, in X-Men Apocalypse, Havoc didn't really have the need of a suit. Had he not destroyed Cerebro, Apocalypse would have used it, and the events of the film would have been fairly different. It was his attempt to stop Apocalypse and his four horsemen that ultimately caused his death. He shot a beam at the bad guys, but they teleported. The beam then reflected on the expansion's generator, and the resultant explosion caused his death. Quicksilver managed to save everyone from the explosion, but Havoc died because he was too close to the blast. Yukio. Yukio is one of those select mutants who have had varying powers and abilities in different X-Men films. In the original timeline, she was adopted by Yashida after her parents died when she was just five. Yashida took her in and she served his granddaughter Mariko as a sister and trained protector. When Yashida was about to die, he asked Yukio to find and bring Wolverine to Japan. Over the course of the movie, Yukio becomes Logan's ally and helps him fight several enemies like Viper and the Silver Samurai. In fact, Yukio is the one who actually kills Viper by hanging her to death. However, in Deadpool 2, Yukio is played by a different actress and nothing about Yukio's character is the same apart from her ethnicity. In the original timeline, Yukio was a young girl who was cold and dedicated, but Deadpool 2's Yukio was a bubbly girl who would unfailingly greet Deadpool every time she met him with all the cheer and happiness of the world. Furthermore, in the original timeline, Yukio had the power to predict people's deaths and was a trained fighter, but she had the power of generating and manipulating electricity in Deadpool 2. X-24 The character X-24 appeared in the 2017 film Logan and was created because Project X-23 was deemed to be a failure. This freshly baked mutant was a perfect replica of Logan's prime years, at least as far as physical traits are concerned. Created by Dr. Xander Rice, X-24 was a beast resembling the ferocity and rage of an attack dog and lacked all the self-control and compassion that lived inside Logan. The X-24 was tasked with the objective of exterminating all the other test subjects, and it included X-23, a young girl who shared Logan's blood. She was on the run with him and a terribly ill Professor X. X-24 did manage to capture his young target and was taking him to Rice, but was confronted with a few locals who shared beef with Logan. He killed all of them before Logan arrived at Ground Zero and defeated X-24 for the time being with the help of a mortally wounded Mr. Munson, whose family had already been slain by X-24. After this, he's taken back to Xander Rice, who injects him with a serum that replenishes X-24 with his former vigor and power. By the end of the film, Logan and a savage X-24 fight each other, and the latter manages to mortally wound Logan. However, X-23 shoots the beast in the head with an adamantium bullet, ending X-24's life. So, despite being more powerful than Logan himself, X-24 lacked the enhanced healing factor that Logan had had in his own youth.
Caliban. In the past, Caliban was an extremely greedy mutant who could risk the safety of his own kind for money. However, as time passed, Caliban became kinder and more compassionate, and remained one of the few friends that Logan had in his life. By 2029, he'd became a caregiver to Professor X, whose mental health was in a sharp decline. Caliban is taken captive by the bad guys who were using him as a tracker to locate Logan, Professor X, and X-23. However, Caliban sacrifices himself to give his friends a window to escape, and to ensure that his own powers were not used against his friends. Caliban's primary power was mutant gene detection. He could sense anyone who possessed the X gene and used his superhuman olfactory senses to track people. In fact, he could even smell sickness and other things like the composition of objects. His tracking abilities are only enhanced by his gifted intellect and perceptive skills. But the one weakness that Caliban had was direct sunlight. Much like vampires, he could not stand direct sunlight and it was the only thing that could be used to torture him. Agent Zero Agent Zero was a part of the Team X along with the likes of Deadpool, Sabretooth and Wolverine. However, after the team got disbanded, only Sabretooth and Agent Zero remained loyal to their leader, Stryker. Six years after a genocidal event in Africa, Zero and Sabretooth visit Logan to get him back to Stryker. After Logan has adamantium injected into his bones, he escaped the facility and Stryker sends Zero after Logan. The man does everything in his capacity to track Logan and ultimately finds him in a barn owned by an elderly couple whom Agent Zero kills. Logan escapes on his motorbike while Agent Zero remains in hot pursuit on a chopper. The Claude Crusader brings the chopper down before putting it on fire. Agent Zero was trapped inside and burned to his death when the chopper exploded. Agent Zero's most credible power was the absorption of kinetic energy. He could fall from great heights and sustain little to no injury. In fact, he could gain kinetic energy through the course of the fall which he would channel for attacking others. Also, it was extremely difficult to track him because his body didn't produce any smell whatsoever. Now, that's one superpower most men and some women would die for. Bolt. Born as Christopher Bradley, Bolt was a member of Stryker's Team X. After the team got disbanded, he started working at a carnival where he would dupe people of their money by rigging the game with his technopathy and electrokinesis. When Stryker needed Bolt's DNA for Weapon 11, he sent Sabretooth to fetch it. Sabretooth unceremoniously kills Bolt, so Bradley's primary power was his ability to control all forms of electrical devices using his mind. He can control anything between a light bulb and an aeroplane. Furthermore, Bradley could generate electricity in small amounts. However, he was potent enough to control a large magnitude of electricity because when he died, he inadvertently caused the blackout of an entire carnival. Blink. In days of future past, Blink, or Clarice Fong, uses her portal creation abilities to teleport Warpath and herself to a Kremlin bomb shelter. Soon, Warpath detects that Sentinels were approaching them, and in the ensuing fight, Blink is killed. But Shadowcat manages to send Bishop's consciousness into his past self, and he's able to alert the mutants in time, which erases Blink's death from history. Now at a Chinese monastery, the group sends Wolverine back to the year when Trask unleashed the first ever Sentinels on Earth. Blink does her best to create portals to help her teammates and to make the sentinels attack each other. However, she soon gets heavily outnumbered and overwhelmed by sentinels who stab her from several directions. It's no surprise that Blink's most valued ability is creation of purple teleportation rings or vacuums. She controls these vacuums, and anything that fails to exit the vacuums finds itself severed, be it humans, sentinels, or mutants. The source of her power rests in the something called the dimensional energy, which she bends at will to open and close portals. She has pointed ears which could be a mutation that helped her enhance her powers. Angel Salvador Angel Salvador once worked as a stripper, but like so many other strippers, her job disgusted her because of the stupid things men did and expected of her. Naturally, she held little to no regard for humanity, especially men. Despite being proud of her superpowers, she constantly had to hide them. So, when Sebastian Shaw came with the prospect of embracing and showing off her powers, she couldn't resist. 
and joined the Hellfire Club. She seemed like a calm and composed woman, but often let her emotions and feelings get the better of her. Out of all of her fellow Hellfire Club members, Angel Salvador was the most keen about initiating the Cuban Missile Crisis, and by extension, the Third World War. Although she was probably the most loyal follower of Sebastian Shaw, she switched sides and joined Magneto when it suited her. But then again, both these men shared the same ideology. Angel Salvador's powers included flight and acidic projectiles. She would conceal her her insectoid wings as tattoos, but it was her extremely corrosive saliva that made her a deadly force. But they were potent enough to eat through most things, including stones. Psylocke In the revised timeline, Psylocke served Caliban as his bodyguard. When Apocalypse came to Caliban looking for more mutants, she held Apocalypse and Storm at knife point. But Apocalypse gets impressed by bravery and ruthlessness and offers a place in his ranks. He gave her more powers and a new uniform. I know the kind of mutants you're looking for and I know where to find them. Psylocke would then accompany Apocalypse and Storm to recruit Magneto and Angel. When the X-Men arrive in Cairo to retrieve Professor X, Psylocke and Beast get into a fight. The mutants successfully rescue Xavier while Psylocke gets into their jet, but Nightcrawler saves the day by teleporting everyone except Psylocke and Angel from the jet which was set to crash. However, Psylocke manages to survive, but doesn't join the X-Men when Apocalypse is finally killed. It was unlike Magneto and Storm, who either became an adversary or an ally of the X-Men. Psylocke's powers came from her ability to manipulate and create psionic energy. She used this power to create several weapons like blades, katanas and whips. And of course, she'd been an expert fighter. Or else why would Caliban hire her as a bodyguard? Domino and doubtful. <laughs> Domino. When the young Russell Collins was in danger, Deadpool decided to build his own mutant team and started accepting entries for positions. Domino was one of the many applicants who came to be a part of the X-Force. She described her power as simply being lucky, but there was more to it than that. Although Deadpool doesn't think that her superpower was really a superpower, she ends up becoming a part of Deadpool's team. Deadpool's first disastrous decision was making the crew jump off a plane with parachutes. Despite being warned that the wind speed was too high for a parachute insertion, as would have been expected, all the members of the team died gruesome but darkly comical deaths, and only Deadpool and Domino survived. When Cable and Deadpool joined hands to fight Juggernaut, Domino went with them to Essex House. Domino saved several staff members of the orphanage while the building burned to the ground. Although it seems that her powers were something supernatural, they did have a more logical reasoning, at least by superhero standards. Domino could actually control the field of probability in her line of sight to start a domino effect that would turn things into her favorite. Her subconscious mind psionically initiates a string of events and makes improbable things happen, which seem like good luck to a layman. But apart from this, she was a skilled marksman and an expert combatant. Multiple Man Multiple Man didn't appear in many movies. Ah, and I'm not very surprised. James Madrox was once recruited by Magneto to serve the Brotherhood of Mutants. His primary and only power was self-duplication. He could create over a hundred copies of himself, and he could merge with those copies as long as they were conscious and alive. While it may seem like a great power to rob banks and to act as decoys, there was little more than that to him. Banshee. John Cassidy, or Banshee, was one of the first mutants recruited by Professor X and Magneto to serve as the X-Men. What you're doing is incredible. You're hitting a pitch with sound waves that have the same resonant frequency as the glass. That's why it shatters. While the young mutants prepared to fight against Sebastian Shaw and his Hellfire Club, Beast gave Banshee a suit that could help him propel through air using the hypersonic beams that Banshee could produce. Banshee couldn't really control his powers initially and was helped by Magneto. In fact, Banshee was reluctant to use the suit that Beast had built because he was afraid of falling and dying. But Magneto pushes him from the top of a satellite dish. Blanketed by pure terror, Banshee screamed, and the sound waves that he produced were potent enough to keep him afloat. His newfound confidence in his powers and abilities proved most valuable for the infant X-Men team. Not only did he deal damage to the Hellfire Club members, but he saved his teammates on more than a few occasions. So it must have become obvious by now that Banshee's powers were essentially manipulating and creating uber-powerful sound waves with his voice. These helped him in various tasks, including flight and echolocating underwater objects, much like a radar. Additionally, his sonic screams can be dangerous and they can shatter glass and other solid objects. Educate them. Let them know that we're here to stay. Come on. Fat. 
Another inconsequential mutant who appeared in X-Men The Last Stand was Fat, or William Riley. He joined Magneto and his Brotherhood of Mutants and made his first appearance at a small community meeting. He transformed the shape of his body to expand, shrink. However, he was soon killed by Colossus and Iceman. His only power was stretching his body fat to make himself superhumanly large and fat. Fat essentially gives us the impression of Blob, but without the ability to change his physique. Oh, Dory, I'm here to help you. We gotta get you out of here. Leech. Leech played an important role in the film X-Men The Last Stand, which focused around a cure for mutants, which was basically a serum that ripped the mutants of their abilities. Leech's powers were draining mutant powers when a mutant came close to him. When Magneto learned of this, he planned to kill Leech in Alcatraz Island. He attacked the facility along with the Brotherhood of Mutants, but they were repelled by the combined force of X-Men and Federal troops. When Juggernaut tried to break into the cell to kill Leech, the former's powers vanished and he ended up knocking himself out. Later, Bobby Drake and Kitty Pride save Leech, and the young mutant becomes a student at Professor Xavier's school for gifted youngsters. I'm very excited to see your culture. Well, you're not going to see it here. The only thing American about this place is Jubilee. Jubilation Lee, or Jubilee, was a loving and kind mutant who was always eager to learn but found herself in the midst of trouble. She made friends with Cyclops and Jean, despite knowing that they hadn't yet learned to control their powers. Also, she befriended Nightcrawler when all other young mutants avoided him because of how he looked. Apart from this, she had little role to play in the X-Men films. Oh yeah, she was also selected by Professor X to welcome new students because of her friendly and kind nature. As far as her powers are concerned, Jubilee could generate and project electrical arcs along with colorful pyrotechnic energy. She could hack electronics. I'm not sure why Jubilation Lee was reduced to a side character, because she had good potential and could do better than a decorated doorman. Darwin. Armando Munoz, or Darwin, appeared in X-Men First Class and used to work as a taxi driver before meeting Professor X and Magneto, who requested him to join their mutant group. When Sebastian Shaw began recruiting members in his own mutant group called the Hellfire Club, he placed a huge magnitude of kinetic energy inside Darwin, who tried to save himself but failed. It was Darwin's death that acted as a catalyst in the struggle against Sebastian Shaw. Darwin's power was quite unique, actually. He could transform his physiology to adapt to almost almost any situation and environment. For instance, he could grow gills underwater and turn into iron when subjected to high temperatures. Mutant 143 Mutant 143 was actually Jason Stryker, the son of William Stryker, who was born with mutant abilities, much to William's disgust. Jason could create mental illusions to anyone he made eye contact with, and these illusions ranged from beautiful to horrifying, depending on Jason's relationship with the person and his imagination. Furthermore, he could make them say and do things without any constraints, much like Professor X could. When Stryker learned about Jason's ability, he immediately sent his young ward to Professor Xavier's school for the gifted youngsters in the hope that Professor X would cure Jason of his powers. He tried to teach Jason to control the powers. At the school, Jason was among kids who were like him, differently special, and he didn't feel like an outcast. However, when Stryker learned about this, he pulled Jason out of the school. The young boy was angry at his parents for this, and he resorted to tormenting and torturing his parents. He would plant terrible illusions in his parents' minds. On one fateful day, his mother couldn't bear the images anymore and stuck a power drill on her left temple to commit suicide. Side. In the end, she took a power drill to her left temple in an attempt. William blamed his son for his wife's death and froze him cryogenically at the Three Mile Island facility. Between the events of the movies X-Men Origins Wolverine and X2 X-Men United, Stryker lobotomized his son and used his spinal fluid to make a compound that could make mutants follow verbal commands. In X-Men United, Jason was supposed to be the weapon that killed all mutants, but Magneto ordered him to kill all humans. In the end, Storm froze Jason back, and the mutant died when a dam burst and flooded the Three Mile Island facility. Bullshit right now! And you are... Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Negasonic Teenage Warhead Ellie Fimister is someone who can literally generate nuclear blasts from her body. As a person, she's rather antisocial and unmotivated, yet sarcastic and snarky. I mean, she cares so little about what others think about her that she goes by the obnoxious mutant name Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Quite contrary to the stereotypically angry teenager that Deadpool thinks she is, she often proves to be quite heroic. As a member of the X-Men, the young girl has often proven to be quite useful and remains good-hearted, despite 
despite the cold temperament she loves to display. Both the Deadpool films would have been far less enjoyable had there not been a teenage warhead to share a love-hate relationship with Deadpool. I already mentioned that one of her powers is nuclear detonations. She can generate explosions of different magnitudes. From making a car fly into the air to leveling an entire scrapyard, there's nothing Negasonic can't do. Furthermore, she uses these powers in combination with her full body charge to fight strong mutants. To lift herself into the air, Negasonic uses a downward explosion. Furthermore, she can generate what can be described as thermochemical energy, which she then uses as a concussion bomb. If the term bombshell was to be personified, we would get Negasonic Teenage Warhead. <laughs> Azazel Azazel is a destructive and ruthless egoist who is faithful to Sebastian Shaw and pursues his philosophies, supposedly as they both believe mutants are exceptionally superior to humans. Azazel, like his master, was a depraved and insensitive mutant who would kill anyone and everyone who came in the way of his objective. Throughout their invasion of the Division X facility, he murdered the Man in Black and numerous officials alongside Riptide and Shaw. They strived to employ the newly established X-Men into the Hellfire Club and were successful in bringing one of them on board, Angel Salvador. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, his kidnapping of a Soviet cargo vessel almost resulted in a nuclear war. Following Shaw's death, Azazel and the remaining Hellfire Club merged with the Brotherhood of Mutants, led by Magneto. He destroyed many humans before strangling Banshee and was revealed to enjoy it discreetly. While he was speechless and non-responsive to epithets, he was able to discern signals and understand when or how to secure hands and levitate within a moment, demonstrating his ability to collaborate with his group. Azazel was more passive than Emma Frost, less susceptible than Angel Salvador, and undoubtedly less flashy than Sebastian Shaw, with a character most reminiscent of Riptide. While he was willing to die for sure, he had no hesitation about defecting allegiance for when it adapted him, as evidenced by his joining Eric ever since he took over Shaw's role. Azazel can transfer and evade around any battleground almost instantly in response. His impulses matched beasts, and amidst the beam's high speed, he efficiently prevented it twice. Azazel can quickly cure minor damage, but he still has a gash over his face. Azazel ages slowly. It's unidentified how old he is. His comic equivalents date back over 1,000 years. He could well have encountered Sebastian Shaw before the Second World War, and he was probably his first and oldest ally, since they both have a slow aging mechanism. Azazel's adaptability, stability, and bodily alignment are amplified further than the environmental boundaries of the human body. Azazel's teleporting ability can deteriorate non-teleporters, because his body is highly immune to his ability. Cypher Douglas Ramsey, also known as Cypher, was seen in X2, X-Men United, as a young mutant at Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. Portrayed by actor Nolan Funk, Cypher was amongst the many students who were captured by William Stryker and rescued by the X-Men. His gifts were among the few which weren't easily recognized at first. Cypher could quickly learn, understand, and speak any language fluently. His abilities in the comics were hidden quite well, and it's not uncommon for humans to know multiple languages. Professor X had doubts about him being a mutant when he first saw him recite an old language language at a young age. Though he wasn't of much use to the X-Men in the movies, his comic counterpart had helped them in numerous missions on Earth and in space to ease communications. Hopefully, as the X-Men merges with Marvel, we can see more of Cypher's abilities, either communicating or manipulating the other forces to work in favor of Cypher. Fire. Fist. Before the X-Men franchise introduced new mutants, we met with the invincible Fire Fist in Deadpool 2. The kid, played by Julian Dennison, whom Wade Wilson unofficially adopted in the film, was Russell Collins, a mutant known by the name of Fire Fist. As his name suggests, he has the power to generate fire and tries very hard to control it. The fire creates a psionic energy field around him that protects him from the blazing flames and heat. Russell is a rage-filled, noxious adolescent. All of this arises from the personnel at the children's home, where he was placed, abusing and torturing him. Amidst this, Russell is a great kid who is prepared to defend those he recognizes as friends. He was raised in the Essex House for Mutant Rehabilitation, where he suffered and was tormented by the orphanage's dean, plainly because he was a mutant. This incites his rage, prompting him to seek vengeance. Russell ultimately snaps and unleashes his abilities. X-Men mutants Colossus, Negasonic Teenage Warhead, and Deadpool show up to stop him. Deadpool manages to calm him down, but realizes that the staff have been mistreating him and the other kids. Furthermore, 
they've murdered one of them. Both mutants are apprehended, positioned in power disrupting colors, and transported to the ICE jail cell. In the jail cell, Deadpool and Firefist meet a man from the future named Cable, who is dead set on killing the kid. Russell is a terrorist in the years ahead where Cable arrives from, who, after exacting his retribution on the Dean, begins to relish murdering civilians and decides to commit mass murder throughout his existence. In that time frame, he and Cable regularly quarreled, with the remainder emerging dangerously close to executing him several times. Russell decided to harm him by proceeding after Cable's family. He burst into his house one night while Cable was away, leaving his wife and daughter defenseless. Russell used his abilities to set fire to their residence, massacring Cable's family. This, in turn, triggered Cable's objective to commute back in time and kill Russell before he murdered his entire family. In the film Logan, Charles Xavier is rumored to have injured 600 people and killed seven of his students. It's unknown where and how Russell ends up among the wounded or the dead. Ash Man Ash was born in 1973, and his family worked at nuclear reactors before his birth, which could have prompted his gene variant. There's no additional information about him in the movies, but Ash appears to have skin that looks like crystallized molten rock. It's uncertain whether this enhanced his resilience or durability. Ash is a mutant who became a member of Magneto's third embodiment of the Brotherhood. He fought in the Battle of Alcatraz, where he used his abilities to vaporize enemy soldiers. Ash could expel flammable volcanic ash from his mouth. This discharge was powerful enough to strike human troops off their feet. It's unclear whether he fled or was killed by the Phoenix. Ashman is not a character found in the comics, so it was a huge risk for Marvel to introduce new characters in the movies, so it was no surprise that the character was given a small role and didn't become popular. Do you know any mutants from the movies that were not part of the comics? Comment your answers down below. Blob Herman Blob Herman Born Robert Herman merged with the Brotherhood and used to be a part of the Omegas and took part in the conflict on Alcatraz. The Brotherhood of Mutants was a clan of super gene mutants who essentially hated humans for treating them differently. The group is led by Magneto and has many powerful mutants who defy the rules of humanity and often clash with X-Men, another mutant clan which protects humanity despite their differences. Glob has a unique ability, presumably not by birth. His body is made of transparent wax, which shows his skeleton within, making him look very creepy and skinny. During the war, he was hit with a healing dart, which resulted in the loss of his abilities. He could have fled the Isle with the others who fled while Pyro was shooting cars from the Golden Gate Bridge, assisted by Magneto towards the opposite side as they regained consciousness. He could have been hit by one before waking up and died, but if not, he would have managed to regain his abilities at a certain point, as Magneto did. The Ink was part of the X-Men movies in X-Men Days of Future Past and had connections in the revised timeline, while the fate of most characters remained uncertain. Ink is a mutant with the ability to use various skills through the tattoos on his skin. As part of his origins in 1973, Ink was seen in Vietnam while William Stryker shows up to take control of a gang of mutants such as Havoc, Toad and Daniels for Trask Industries' academic purposes. Mystique finally shows up disguised as a United States Army General and exposes her actual self to Stryker before defeating the security officers. He also rendered a number of the officers unconscious by inputting an ailment into his right palm, which was tattooed with a biohazard symbol. Ink and the other mutant combatants fled capture with the help of Mystique by boarding a flight back to the United States. In the original timeline, an aged Ink still is alive in America in 2023. He was apprehended by Guardians and transported to a mutant prison camp in New York. After Wolverine travelled back in time and saved Bolivar Trask from being murdered by Mystique, changing the timeline, we see Ink back in 1973, after he departed from Vietnam and was with Havoc Daniels and Toad. We see them watching Magneto's speech on the news, and Ink was never sent to the concentration camp. Ink's abilities are best seen through the tattoo of a biohazard symbol on his right hand, which prompts an illness in his enemy and causes them to suffer radiation poisoning, which makes them start vomiting. It wasn't made clear in the movies how significant the damage would be if someone sustained the exposure of his abilities. Siren Siren is a young child under the care of X-Men Storm. She was first seen in X2, X-Men United as one of Storm's students in the museum. Her unique mutation helps her fend off attackers. When she screams, she produces a horrifying sonic sound that hurts both human and mutant ears. 
disorienting her attackers. Although she would take a long time to control her powers, she made an excellent attempt when Stryker's soldiers tried to kidnap her at the X Mansion. Still, she was subdued with a tranquilizer and was eventually rescued by X-Men Mutant Colossus. Siren was a recurring character and also appeared as a student of Professor X in X-Men The Last Stand and hugged Storm as they mourned the loss of Professor X. Not much was seen from Siren, but a power like hers could make her a huge asset to the X-Men team in the future. Spike. Spike was seen in X-Men The Last Stand as he looked for Jean. He was part of the Omegas and joined the Brotherhood of Mutants under the guidance of Magneto. Darian Elliot, known as Spike, is a mutant who could shoot Spike bone missiles out of his wrists. His competitor in the movie was Wolverine, a mutant who has adamantium claws. Wolverine and Spike have a brief encounter when the latter is set out to look for Jean to attack her, ultimately resulting in Wolverine impaling Spike with his claws in his chest. He also has expedited cell viability to seal the wounds inflicted by projecting his razor the sharp spikes, as he could remain and move without obvious damage seconds after Wolverine tosses one of his spikes into Spike's leg. Since there's no mention of Spike in other movies and the return timeline, he's presumed dead for now. But a villain like him could be explored in future movies. Callisto. Callisto is a mutant and part of the Omega team. She aligned herself with Magneto and his brotherhood because they hold common perceptions. Callisto has an extraordinary power to detect mutant presence around her and that's how she was able to identify Mystique and added two new associates, Juggernaut and Multiple Man. Callisto proved her attributes and quickly rose to the position of commander. Magneto asked Callisto to use her abilities to track down mutants multiple times. Callisto is a skilled warrior and she chiefly fights Storm at Jean Grey's home. She pervades Storm in their first contact mauling her adversary around the house with her hyperspeed and fighting skills. Storm is hardly able to secure herself and is incapable of producing much offensive moves. Storm and Callisto combat yet again in the final confrontation on Alcatraz. The fight begins similarly to the first, with Callisto acquiring an initial lead, knocking Storm down and docking some punitive punches to the face and stomach. Storm, however, fights back and ends the war by throwing Callisto against a gate and electrocuting her to death. Artie Maddox. We first see Artie in Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, where during a trip to the exhibition, Artie is part of the pupils who were being instructed by Storm. He noticed a girl eating ice cream, and she stuck her tongue out at him. In return, he stuck out his colored forked tongue at the girl, allowing her to flee from there in horror. Storm captures him, calls out to Artie as his tongue disappears, and enforce him not to display his powers in public. We see a glimpse of his name on a file when Mystique hacked Stryker's computer, and later Stryker's soldiers attack the X-Men mansion and kidnapped him, but was later rescued by the X-Men. In X-Men The Last Stand, Artie was seen in a small role as he sat behind Jones in the classroom and later attended Professor X's funeral. Though we haven't seen Artie using his potential, his forked tongue is similar to that of a snake. Because of the resemblance, it's plausible that Artie's tongue provides him with an elevated sense of flavor and odor equivalent to that of a snake. But whether he's poisonous or not remains a mystery. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.